right, well, good morning. I see that everyone has tuned in to join us this morning. Hope everyone is staying warm, staying safe, and staying blessed. Hopefully by next Sunday, if the Lord wills, uh, everything will be melted, uh, the ice will be melted, the snow will be melted, and uh, we'll all be able to rejoin back together here at the Worship Assembly at the Painburn Church of Christ. But in the meantime, continue on staying safe, staying warm, and staying blessed. Blessed. I appreciate uh, Brother Hunter's uh, wonderful uh, class lesson that he did earlier. I appreciate all the wonderful work that he does, as well as the men and the women of the church here at Painburn. I appreciate and love each and every one of y'all. We're going to go ahead and get started here. I'm sure many of you have heard about Muhammad Ali. Muhammad Ali was one of the greatest boxers in the history of the sport. He was quick, agile, and light on his feet. As he Himself would put it, he floats like a butterfly and stings like a bee. I don't know why I do that, but every time I hear that phrase, float like a butterfly, I just do this and sting like a bee. He was physically built as a heavyweight, but he was able to move in the ring as a lightweight and featherweight. But to call Ali a heavyweight based upon his physique, well, it's not just a commentary on his physical appearance, but he can also be a heavyweight when it comes to his mouth. He was not called the Louisville Lip for no reason. Consider what he stated before his 1971 fight with Joe Frazier. He said, there seems to be some confusion. We're going to clear this confusion up on March 8th. We're going to decide once and for all who is king. There's not a man alive who can whip me. I'm too smart. I'm too pretty. I am the greatest. I am the king. I should be a posted stamp because that's the only way I could get licked. Ali never seemed to be at a loss for boastful words. But he was neither the first nor the last to boast of his invincibility. In the days of Obadiah, the prophet, the nation of Edom sounded a lot like the Louisville lip. Though Edom took pride in a perceived invincibility among the nations, God would bring them down to earth. Obadiah verse 4. Obadiah is a minor prophet within the Old Testament, and he only has one chapter. It is a book consists of 21 verses. It is the shortest book in the Old Testament, but it's the book right before Jonah and after Amos. A little bit of a background of this writer, this prophet Obadiah. His name means servant of the Lord. It seems to have been a common name among the Jewish people, with no less than 13 different men wearing it in the Old Testament. Concerning this particular prophet, nothing much is about him. We don't have much background information on where he is, where he came from, or his uh, heritage and his family and his uh, generation line. There's nothing much said about him. But according to the Talmud, which is that ancient Jewish commentary of the Old Testament that I've referred to in previous lessons, they believe this Obadiah to be the steward of King Ahab in 1 Kings chapter 18. However, that is very unlikely. But what we do know is that the Old Testament was written according for our learning, Romans chapter 15, verse 4. Therefore, from the book of Obadiah, we learn from Edom's mistakes. We must learn from Edom's mistakes. Now, as we look at this short minor prophet book, I'd like to go ahead and break it down into two major points as we discuss about Edom's mistakes. From our first point, I'd like for us to look at the exposition of the text. 
Obadiah's message exposed. Obadiah's message exposed. When we look at verse 1, the prophet says, Thus says the Lord God concerning Edom, We have heard a report from the Lord, and a messenger has been sent, stirring among the nations. Rise up, let us rise against her for battle. The prophet Obadiah, as well as Jeremiah, from his book, Jeremiah chapter 49, verse 14, had been given a report from the, from the Lord regarding Edom's recent activity. And as a result, God had sent a messenger among the nations. Now, this messenger would not be a literal messenger that's traveling around, but a figurative expression of the working of God and stirring up certain nations to rise up against Edom, to bring that nation down. What is the declaration that we have here from Obadiah's message? Well, its declaration is that God will deflate Edom's big head. God will deflate Edom's big head. And how will God do that? Well, let's continue on reading. Verse 2 and following. Behold, I will make you among, small among the nations. You shall be utterly despised. The pride of your heart has deceived you, you who live in the clefts of the rock, in your lofty dwelling, who say in your heart, Who will bring me down to the ground? Though you soar aloft like the eagle, though your nest is set among the stars, from there I will bring you down, says the Lord. Well, God says that he's going to do specifically three things that involves deflating Edom's big head. First off, he says, I will make you small among the nations. This word small in Hebrew conveys the idea of being of low status compared to others, complete insignificance. Edom boasted about how big they were. And yes, Edom had a lot of ancient cities in its territory as a nation. And so they were set among the other nations. They were set high among the nations. They were big. But God says, I'm going to make you small. Completely insignificant. Not only that, God says, I will make sure that you are utterly despised. Utterly despised. This word despised in Hebrew means to regard someone or something as worthless, being of no value. So not only are you going to be completely insignificant, but you're going to be worthless. You're going to be of no value. You're not going to be talked about. You're not going to be recognized. You're going to be Worthless, as if you're nothing. Third, God says that I will bring you down. Edom's cities were accessible only through narrow, easily defendable mountain passes. One of these ancient cities would have been the city of Petra. And according to archaeologists, with massive cliffs more than 700 feet high, sheltering a narrow canyon a mile in length, the Edomite city of Petra was able to repel any invasion. So, in their arrogance, Edom mockingly asks, Who will bring us down? Look, we live in lofty dwellings. We live in clefts of the rock that are 700 feet high. We can easily repel any other nation, any other invasion or enemy attack. Nobody can stop us. Nobody can bring us down. Well, who will bring you down? God would. Though the people lived in 700 massive cliffs and clefts of the rock, their little lofty dwellings, there would be no hiding from God's judgment. 
It is God who is in control of the movement of nations, Daniel chapter 4, verse 24 and 25. And if he decides it is time for a nation to be overthrown, he will do it. He decides when it's time for a nation to be brought down. And when it's that time, he will do it. Not only from this declaration, we see the destruction's completeness. The destruction within this message, within this declaration that's being brought to Edom's attention is going to be complete. Complete destruction. Obadiah gives two illustrations that help emphasize the complete destruction that God will bring upon Edom. Continue on with me in verse 5 and 6. If thieves came to you, if plunderers came by night, how you have been destroyed. Would they not steal only enough for themselves? If great gatherers came to you, would they not leave gleanings? How Esau has been pillaged, his treasures sought out. The first illustration that Obadiah gives to further emphasize Edom's complete destruction is the illustration of thieves and plunderers, or robbers. As a general rule, if thieves and robbers break into a house, they, will, uh, they could only steal enough for them to transport. They can only carry so much, therefore leaving a few valuable items behind. The second illustration involves grape gatherers, and it's the same idea. Those who reap vineyards are only able to gather what they could transport, therefore having to leave behind some grapes on the vineyards. So the point that Obadiah is making is that unlike robbers and grape gatherers who leave some belongings behind because they can only carry so much of what they could transport, God will leave nothing behind. God will leave nothing behind after he's done with Edom. All your treasures, all your wealth, all your belongings are going to be completely gone. No trace of who you are, no trace of what you have will be left behind. It is complete destruction. Not only is the destruction going to be complete, but also he gives a list Concerning about its calamity. Continue on with me in verse 7 through 9. He says, All your allies have driven you to your border. Those at peace with you have deceived you. They have prevailed against you. Those who eat your bread have set a trap beneath you. You have no understanding. Will I not on that day, declares the Lord, Destroy the wise men out of Edom, and understanding out of Mount Esau. And your mighty men shall be dismayed, O Taman, so that every man from Mount Esau will be cut off by slaughter. So what is this calamity that's going to happen? What is it going to involve? Well, this calamity that's going to take place is going to be from their own allies. From their own allies, verse 7, all your allies have driven you to your border. Those at peace with you have deceived you. Those who eat your bread have set a trap beneath you. Those with whom Edom had made alliances for trade and peace would turn against them. Throughout the Old Testament, God has always been furious whenever his people try to make foreign alliances. God would say, don't make foreign alliances. Why? Because, number one, you're putting your trust in man and not in God. Number two, when you make foreign alliances, eventually they're going to turn around and stab you in the back. So God would always get upset whenever his people tried to make foreign alliances without his consent. Those that ate their bread... That is, those who had benefited from trade agreements with Edom would turn around and stab Edom in the back. And when all this is going on, Edom would be totally unaware 
of what's happening. They wouldn't even see it coming. In general, the deceitfulness of confederates has been the experience of history and is a lesson that nations of today would do well to learn. Not only will they have calamity from their own allies, but they will have calamity from their wise men and mighty men. Verse 8 and 9, Will I not on that day, declares the Lord, destroy the wise men out of Edom? Now these wise men were perhaps the strategic military advisors and veterans for the king. Their wisdom would be confused and they would fail their country in its greatest time of need. But not only will their wisdom be confused, even their mighty men, their army, all of their mighty warriors will be helpless. Without the wisdom and strategy they need, their mighty warriors from the nation's capital, Taman, are powerless to help. With God against him, his confederates gone, and his wise and mighty men made helpless, Edom was doomed. But now the question, this was a question that I had many years ago when studying through the Minor Prophets, was why? Why would God specifically do this to Edom? And the reason why I ask that question is because Edom was not even part of God's people. Edom came from Esau. Esau was not the chosen one. Well, he was, but he gave it up. The tribe of Israel came from Jacob. That was the chosen seed. And so, really, Edom has nothing to do with God's people. So why, why would God even care or bother what Edom was doing? Well, that's going to be our second part Point number two of this morning's lesson. Obadiah's message explained. After exposing what the message is about and what God's going to do, he then gives an explanation for why God is doing this to Edom. Obadiah's message explained. Verse 3 and verse 10 through 16. So one of the reasons why God is calling out Edom and bringing Edom down to earth is because pride is deceptive and destructive. Pride is deceptive and destructive. When you go back to verse 3, God says, The pride of your heart has deceived you. The Edomites boasted in their national security without considering that the only real national security is found in God. Their arrogance deceived them into thinking that no one could bring them down to their knees. Well, they were not the first, nor the last, to have fallen victim to human conceit. Folks, it will do well to remember that the Lord tears down the house of the proud. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 25. Pride goes before destruction, and a haughty spirit before its fall. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18. There are six things that the Lord hates, one of them being a proud look. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16 and 17. We must never let pride deceive us. It is pride that deceives us into thinking that American Christians are the only ones going to heaven. It is pride that deceives people into thinking that good looks, powerful positions, extraordinary intelligence, wealth, or fame will keep them safe from the wrath of God. It is pride that deceives us into thinking that God doesn't care how we worship. It is pride that deceives us into thinking that the works of the flesh are not all bad. It is pride that deceives us into thinking that God is not really looking out for our best interests. It is pride that deceives us into thinking that we must police 
the brotherhood and verbally abuse anyone who does not adopt our views in matters of opinion. It is pride that deceives us into thinking that we can put question marks where God put periods. Folks, from the days of Adam and Eve until this good moment, men and women have fallen victims, have let the pride of life bring them to spiritual ruin. James chapter 4, verse 16. Not only were they a prideful and boastful type of people, another reason and explanation why God is bringing destruction upon Edom is because they violated the brotherhood. Edom had violated the brotherhood. If you will, look with me at verse 10 and 11. Because of the violence done to your brother Jacob, shame shall cover you. And you shall be cut off forever. On the day that you stood aloof, on the day that strangers carried off his wealth, and foreigners entered his gates and cast lots for Jerusalem, you were like one of them. God cares about how we treat one another in the bond of brotherhood. Recall the words of God from Deuteronomy chapter 23 verse 7 you shall not loathe an Edomite for he is your brother the tribe of Israel came from Jacob and Edom from Esau they were brothers if this was how God wanted Israel to act toward Edom it was also God's desire for Edom to act the same way toward Israel the brotherhood relationship goes both ways. Yet when the Edomites saw their brethren being attacked, they stood aloof. That is, they stood on the other side, standing with Jacob's, the tribe of Israel's, enemies. Well, in what ways? Well, look with me at verse 12 through 14. Look at the list that the prophet gives. Do not gloat over the day of your brother and the day of his misfortune. Do not rejoice over the people of Judah in the day of their ruin. Boy, they were celebrating. They were celebrating when they saw their own brothers being slaughtered. Do not boast in the day of their distress. Do not enter the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. Do not gloat over his disaster in the day of his calamity. Do not loot his wealth in the day of his calamity. Do not stand at the crossroads to cut off his fugitives. Do not hand over his survivors in the day of distress. In summary, the Edomites laughed. They laughed it up as they watched an enemy army attack Judah. They boasted in their own security. <laughs> you never see that happen to us now. Nobody can bring us down. When the Israelites tried to escape, the Edomites would capture them and turn them over to the enemy invaders. Folks, God takes very seriously our attitudes towards the brand of brotherhood. If God was determined to punish Edom because of how those people had mistreated their brothers, what will God do to us if we fail to love our brothers and sisters in our families, in the communities, and most importantly, in the church? For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. 1 John chapter 4, verse 20. Sound familiar? Well, I quoted it last Sunday morning. The bond of brotherhood in New Testament Christianity is not just a passive avoidance of sinful acts. It is active in the good works. Seeing what good needs to be done and doing it, rather than ignoring our brother's miseries. James chapter 4, verse 17. If anyone knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is a sin. Not only did they violate the brotherhood, but 
they also will reap what they have sown. They are reaping to the whirlwind. Verse 15 and 16, God says, For the day of the Lord is near upon all the nations. As you have done, it shall be done to you. Your deeds shall return on your own head. For as you have drunk on my holy mountain, so all the nations shall drink continually. They shall drink and swallow and shall be as though they had never been. As the Edomites had treated Judah, so would they be treated. The principle is embedded in the fabric of Scripture. For whatever a man sows, that he will reap. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7. They sow to the wind and reap the whirlwind. Hosea chapter 8, verse 7. This principle seems to be a rule governing the affairs of people everywhere in every age. Those who lie are lied to. Those who are violent experience violence. The cheaters are cheated. In contrast, those who are kind and generous are likely to receive kindness and generosity from others. Folks, let us take care that our treatment of others is governed by the Lord's words in Matthew chapter 7, verse 17, known as the golden rule. Whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them. Now, often it may seem to us that evil people do not reap what they sow. But we must remember that judgment will come someday. And the kingdom of God is the best place to be when that time comes. Look at verse 17 and 18 of Obadiah. But in Mount Zion there shall be those who escape, and it shall be holy. And the house of J Jacob shall possess their own possessions. The house of Jacob shall be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame. And the house of Esau stubble. They shall burn them and consume them, and there shall be no survivor for the house of Esau, for the Lord has spoken. Obadiah says on Mount Zion there shall be a deliverance. Now this could definitely be a prophetic reference to the church in heaven, which is Christ's kingdom. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28. Earthly kingdoms come and go, but the kingdom of God will exist throughout eternity. Daniel chapter 2, verse 44. Regardless of what happens in and to America, we can live every day with head held high and smile on face if we are citizens of that indestructible kingdom. Well, folks, we began this lesson with the story of Muhammad Ali. And about his boasting and his physical mouth, heavyweight mouth, who claimed before his 1971 fight with Joe Frazier that he could not be beaten. He was wrong. He lost. He learned his lesson the hard way. And so did ancient Edom. The good news for us is that God loves us so much that he gave us the book of Obadiah, complete with its down-to-earth message, with the hope that we will learn from Edom's mistakes. Folks, if you will, pray with me, and then the lesson is yours. Heavenly Father, we come before you, and we willingly bow our knees to you. We come before you with humble hearts, knowing that you are the Almighty God who is in control of the universe, that you determine and are in complete control that you are working in the world today, working among the nations and working within our lives individually as well. Father, let us take to heart the wonderful message from this amazing, the short but amazing book of Obadiah but how we can learn from the mistakes that Edom made. Allow us to humble ourselves before you so that you may give us grace and that you may lift us up. Let us not think that we can lift ourselves up, 
Let us not have that arrogant, boastful type of attitude or heart, but let us put others first above, our own, above ourselves. Allow us to seek out the interests and the needs of others. More importantly, seek out the needs and the best interests of our brothers and sisters in the church of your Son, Jesus Christ. Let us care for one another. Let us love one another. Let us not violate the brotherhood. Let us not rejoice when one of our own has fallen. Let us not rejoice when one of our own is hurting. But let us weep when one of us is weeping. Let us rejoice when one of us is rejoicing. Let us mourn when one of us is mourning. Allow us to truly understand the principle of reaping what we sow. Allow us to sow kindness and love and good in the lives of all the people that we come in contact with. Allow us to be a part of the true one and only New Testament church that your son Jesus built, which is the kingdom knowing that when we are in the church, we are in the kingdom. And then when we are in the kingdom, we have a spot reserved for us in heaven on Mount Zion. That is the only way that can keep us safe from judgment, is in you, Father. Allow us to glorify you, help and serve others, and put ourselves last. For it's our prayer through your Son's most holy righteous and precious name, Jesus, our Lord, Master, and Savior of our life. Amen. Thank you all so much. I hope you all have a wonderful, blessed afternoon, and I look forward to uh, seeing everybody figuratively and virtually later on this evening at 6 p.m. for our evening study. Thank you all, and have a wonderful, blessed day.